Okay, we're back, we're live. We have a wonderful, serious discussion today with uh, John David Ann, professor of history at HBU. We're talking about Pearl Harbor Remembered. And indeed, today is the day that the Honolulu Star Advertiser published a six-part session, section, okay, about the day of infamy. And in fact, you know, when you think about it, the word infamy seemed to be invented that day. And this was a day when, or immediately after, when FDR used um, the machinery available in those, in those times to talk to the world, to talk to the American public. That, that's that's uh, correct. That that's was, correct. the yeah. whole thing was yeah. unprecedented. It was a yeah. turning point in history, wasn't it? And, um, and, you know, like, this was really big, a sneak attack over thousands of miles using the most modern aircraft at the time mm -hmm. and ships and mm -hmm. carriers right. um, to achieve what was really a, an enormous enormous advance in military in warfare yeah they, and yeah. they pulled it off and they yeah. did tremendous damage um, and I, I we're going to find out about the effect that this moment had on right. American history right. and world history right how big is it in terms of the 20th century well it's been remembered as the moment in American history I mean really I mean uh, we were just talking before the show about uh, the 9-11 attacks and how after the 9-11 attacks George W Bush president then, used, the Pearl Har used Pearl Harbor as a metaphor for how we could pick ourselves up after we were beaten down and, and successfully beat the enemy. So, uh, of course, it's a more complicated si situation. We haven't beaten the terrorists, at mm -hmm. least not yet. But uh, so in our memory, it's the moment of the 20th century. Um, it's, uh, the, the thing is, the Japanese attack was very successful, but it wasn't that successful. If Not you want in the to, long term. That's right. In the course of the war, um, it was, of course, it was a surprise, and it, and it was a, a great blow against the American fleet, but most of the battleships that were hit in Pearl Harbor were actually refloated within six months. Is that right? Yeah. So there were only a couple, the Arizona and, and I think it was the Oklahoma that, that turned turtle. You couldn't refloat that one, and they had to cut that up. This, but this, to me, it's, um, it's, the, the great significance of this is that um, it's all about humanity. It's all about people getting excited. It's all about people you know, putting their resources, their time, their energy, their, their driving force in life to right. a cause. Right. Right. And uh, I, I go back to the conspiratorial theory yeah. we talked about. Yeah. That, okay. Yeah. Right. Of right. Um, you know, Roosevelt knew. This, I mean, this was either the greatest um, you know intelligence blunder, or maybe not. It was not yeah. an intelligence blunder. Yeah. It was a strategic moment. He knew about it, and he knew that if he wanted to have a real war with them, he'd have to galvanize the American public. So it was like he didn't do anything, essentially inviting them in, right. and then he used that in order to make a tremendous war effort here. Yeah, so, so there have been these conspiracy theories from the, the day that Pearl Harbor attack happened. Um, and uh, actually, a famous American historian, Charles Beard, uh, actually wrote a book about this in 1948 and argued that FDR did in fact know about uh, the, the, in, the upcoming attack on Pearl Harbor and yet he refused to tell the American public we really don't have any evidence that that was the case um, and Beard was really heavily criticized honestly it ruined Charles Beard's career to have written that book and take the criticism that he made. It's an unpatriotic thing. Yeah, it was both unpatriotic, but his evidence was real thin. Oh. He was saying there, there were these communiques to uh, consulates, to the consulate in, in Hawaii to be prepared uh, for an attack, but there were, these, were, these communiques were sent to all of the consulates. So it was just a, it was a poor piece of scholarship, I hate to say, for a very, you know, a, a, really a tremendous historian who had a great career, but it was ruined by this conspiracy. And so, yet, we had, we had the sinking of the Maine. Yeah. We had the Tonkin Gulf incident. Right. And these right. all have the feeling of being fabrications uh, that led to aggressive decisions. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, and, and of course, after uh, bringing up the 9-11 uh, the attacks, actually, if, if we could look at picture number six, mm -hmm. which is uh, a, a picture of uh, George. This is a a photograph of George W. Bush giving his first major speech after the 9-11 attacks. This was given to Congress on September 20th, 2001. And in the audience was 
uh, Tom Brokaw, who was the commentator, uh, the NBC commentator, and then he had Stephen Ambrose, a major historian, uh, sitting right next to him. They were talking about the significance of Pearl Harbor as a way of thinking about the 9-11 attacks. Uh, so, in, again, this idea that you could recover from the attacks, that it would mobilize the American people, unite them, just like Pearl Harbor had done, and then we would eventually beat the bad guys. And so. that's what happened. So Pearl Harbor stands, uh, I'm taking from what you said, Pearl Harbor stands as a, you know, an infamous day, a day of a sneak attack, the ultimate sneakiness, uh, and also stands as something that galvanized the American, the American nation. It, it did, indeed, yes. Into yes. man, woman, and children. Yeah, no, we were it's, all it's, on the uh, same page for uh, years. And, and this, of course, was a miscalculation on the part of the Japanese, yes. who believed that they could, what, they, what the Japanese needed to do strategically was take out the American fleet. That way they could have an unimpeded access to Southeast Asia when they invaded Southeast Asia a few months later. And of course, they took over all of Southeast Asia within six months. They were in, you know, the Philippines, Singapore, Burma, uh, even uh, the eastern part of India. They were worried we would stop them. They, they, they were worried about a flank attack on their fleet and their troops as they were going down into Southeast Asia. So they took out the American fleet. It certainly helped them into uh, that invasion, but it was very short-lived. Uh, in May. 1941, uh, of course, the Battle of Midway, uh, the United States actually sunk four of the six Japanese aircraft carriers, and that was really the high point of the Japanese Empire, May, or, May 1941, only six months after Pearl Harbor. So from there on, the Japanese were fighting this defensive the battle. 1942. Uh, 1942, pardon yeah, me. Yeah. Uh, the Japanese were fighting this defensive battle, trying to keep what they had uh, captured in in uh, December 1941. So, um, so it's, uh, it, yes, it mobilized the American nation to a tremendous extent, and uh, it certainly helped us to win the war, win the Pacific War. Um, it, it's fascinating the way it's been remembered. Yes. Uh, during World War II, uh, and if we can have, uh, let's see, that would be picture number two, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, so, some of the ways that Pearl Harbor was remembered was as a, a very a dastardly attack, and it, it, was, it was commemorated that, that it justified uh, the, the, the nastiness of it and the violence of it justified our own violence. And so this is actually a photograph. This is the front page of Life magazine in 1944, and this is actually the skull of a Japanese soldier that the boyfriend of this woman in the photograph had had sent to her oh. as a gift. Oh, what a gift. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's true love for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that shows you the anger. And it, and it's, the it was a violent race war. Yes. Um, and there, were, there was no quarter given. Uh, Americans strafed Japanese lifeboats. Uh, Japanese did suicide attacks on American ships. Uh, it was it was the nasty of nastiest of wars. Compare it with World War One. Was it nastier? Oh yeah, definitely. Yes, yes. But you were I mean, out to kill everyone in sight. That that's correct. And uh, uh, you know there were again there were times when when the Americans captured troops when they they took no quarter and they simply uh, massacred the troops. And there were times when the Japanese took American troops prisoner and they showed no quarter and just just killed everyone so and this came um, out of the Pearl Harbor this was this was uh, payback this people that's, were really ticked off that's that's what the Americans used to justify their payback yeah. so so it was so there was a viciousness in a in a kind of racial identification about uh, the Japanese as a yellow race that was a yellow race dangerous uh, backstabbers uh, you couldn't trust this race of people so it, it led to all kinds of stereotypes about the Japanese. And the fascinating thing is, of course, after the war with the American occupation of Japan, then those stereotypes changed very quickly to a kind of positive. The, the Japanese guerrilla, right, this was one of the ways that the Japanese were portrayed, became a harmless Japanese monkey sitting on the soldier of a GI. That's how it's portrayed in the, in the, in the magazine Leatherneck at the end, of, in the September edition of uh, Leatherneck. Uh, that's how it's portrayed. So, uh, yeah. So interesting. <laughs> that's right. Well, we were, uh, we were ticked off enough to uh, put people in camps. 
Right. Uh, and, re and these characterizations, these profilings that you talk about, uh, they were complete. I mean, every Japanese, uh, with very few exceptions, was suspect in this right. country. That's correct. That's correct. Even American citizens. No, that's right. So, so um, uh, just, just some, some background on uh, what the Japanese actually did before Pearl Harbor, too, yes. in terms of intelligence work. There was, there was what we know is that there was one person in charge of intelligence gathering in Honolulu, and he was an officer with the Japanese consulate. And he would go out, he would visit local bars, and he would go out and surveil uh, Pearl Harbor itself, and the local bars, of course, to get information surreptitiously from, from, uh, from locals about ship positions and such. So uh, we don't really, we don't have any evidence uh, that the j local Japanese American population was involved in spying. Yeah. None. If he was with the consulate, then it was his job That's to correct. gather information. That, and he was not a Japanese American. He was a Japanese citizen and a Japanese national. So you so can't say that it's spying. It's no, not really spying. No, it's, he was doing intelligent, intelligence work uh, for his government, what he was hired to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, and I'm, I've heard that story, but I guess the only indication <laughs> is this one guy. Right. And, and all the other myths about That's right. Japanese sympathizers That's who fed right. information back. Japanese Not true. fishing boats in the harbor, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. radioing back to, yeah. That, that's, a, that's part of the commemoration of Pearl Harbor during the war, is that mythology is created along with Japanese internment and the kind of the demonization of the Japanese-American population in the United States. So yeah. uh, that's kind of, a, that's a low point, of course, of the, of the Pacific War. Uh, for the United States, and it's, it must have led to um, you know what happened at the end with the bomb. It must have led, must have been some influence on Truman when he made that decision. Absolutely, I mean it, there was there was definitely a sense that Pearl Harbor had to be paid back, that it justified uh, you know revenge against the Japanese or or extreme punishment of the Japanese, and certainly uh, the the bombing of Nagasaki and. Hiroshima qualifies with atomic weapons. So it's a whole qualifies. moral, um, a moral episode. It's a drama. Yeah. You know, you have somebody does something really bad, and uh, this is seen. This is in in American art. It's in you know, it's really <laughs> yeah. deep deep in yeah. our culture. It, it, somebody that does something bad, and now you pay them back, that's and correct. then the score is even. That's correct. After two it, bombs. Yeah, in, I suppose in a way. Now it's interesting because. In the post-war period, we have remembered Pearl Harbor in a variety of ways, uh, and I think this is picture five. Yeah, so this is a this is a picture of that famous movie Tora Tora yeah, Tora, which was movie. which was uh, produced in 1970, released in 1970, and of course, this is this is a representation of the Japanese military leadership, the bad guys and yet they don't seem so bad in this movie. <laughs> so what we saw is an evolution from the immediate post-war period to uh, very negative representations to a time period in the 1970s when our representation of the Japanese uh, was actually respectful of their valor and their success at Pearl Harbor. Uh, and so, uh, well, the occupation was successful. The and, occupation and, and changed uh, changed that way of looking at them. Yes. That, that's correct. Yeah, I mean, uh, GIs brought home Japanese wives. Um, uh, we we felt pride in the fact that Japanese had the Japanese nation had become successful economically once again, uh, was a functioning democracy. Uh, so yeah, we we definitely felt some pride in the occupation. Uh, and so I think that that definitely helped. And, and Hawaii somehow is is um, is a gauge on all of this, because Hawaii was the, the place attacked. That's right. And That's Hawaii right. wound up uh, well. It, it already had from the plantations and otherwise had a huge number of Japanese That's correct. here, yep. Yep. and Hawaii sort of came together by 1970. Hawaii was a polyglot, a right, lot of intermarriage, right, right, yeah. and, and the yeah. Japanese held you know many many positions. They were part of it, and the Japanese tourists were starting to come. Right. So the whole thing had turned into a positive uh, image no, that's, experience. That's exactly right. And uh, that positive feeling towards Pearl Harbor and the Pearl Harbor legacy and the Japanese lasts until the late 1980s when 
the Japanese economy is revving very high and actually beginning to challenge the American economy. So it changed then. It did change, and After yes. this break, John, I want to talk about exactly what happened okay. and how that has fed forward till now. Okay. Wow. Okay. John David Ann, professor of history at HPU. We're talking about Pearl Harbor remembered in only a few days away from December 7th. We'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. Start your Pauhana weekend off with the show where I talk to people about issues pertinent to Hawaii. You can see my previous shows at my blog, kauilucas.com, and also on Think Tech's show. Sorry. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Join me every other Monday when we bring lawyers who know how to get across the sea to meet people and resolve problems into your house. Thank you. You, you wish you were here during the break because John and I just keep on going. So, you know, the Torah Torah right. 1970 was not the only movie. Right, that's right. And uh, movies, affect, they, they reflect public feelings, right. they reflect what Hollywood wants to, exactly. thinks how people want, exactly. and, they, and they affect public feelings. Yeah. Yeah. So what was happening in moviedom in that period? Right, so, so famous director Frank Capra took on the, the uh, he actually was offered the contract by the U.S. Uh, Army Signal Corps, which was essentially the arm of intelligence to do films about, to do a film about Pearl Harbor. So uh, Capra did uh, this, this film uh, the the first film on Pearl Harbor in 1942, and and then uh, yeah, and that's that's one of the other films that Frank Frank Capra did, uh, and uh, these films during the war were patriotic films. They were anti-Japanese. They demonized the Japanese. Propaganda. And, and yeah, I mean essentially they were. You said it, but no, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. They were persuasive. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so you know the facts suffer when you have persuasive films like this, but. Uh, after the war, of course, there was a, a, a series, a TV series called Victory at Sea. I remember that. Uh, I think that was also done by Capra. Ah. And uh, that was a more positive portrayal. <clears throat> by the 1950s, we could, with the occupation, uh, we could begin to see uh, the, the Japanese as not quite so evil. Um, well, they were producing electronics, uh, covering the, the U.S. and the world. That's right. Sony had, uh, uh, there's a book, by the way, called Pacific. Yeah. Um, a fellow, um, I can't remember his name right now, uh, but he, wor he worked at the East-West Center. He was okay. in a long time. Yeah. And uh, his recent book, it's a very interesting book, and one of the chapters in this book is... Oh, the, Simon so Winchester. Yeah. That's it, Simon, Simon Winchester. Winchester. Yeah. It's a great book. Uh, a great book. Yeah. And one of them, one of them uh, was yeah. all about Sony and yeah. how Sony emerged. Right. That's exactly right. So there is another film uh, done in 1958 called The Barbarian and the Geisha, and it features John Wayne, and a Japanese actress, and John Wayne is, is uh, he takes the role as Townsend Harris, who was the first American uh, consul to Japan, uh, stationed in 1858. So you have the 100 year anniversary of this, of the treaty with the Japanese and this consul. And these two have this love relationship, and it's, it's a <laughs> hilarious film. But it's interesting because by 1958, then the Americans could see Japan in a much more positive light. So that Pearl Harbor memory had begun to transform. Uh, transformed again in the 80s, and then uh, since the 90s, it's transformed again with, uh, uh, with the, the it, in a couple of days, the Pearl Harbor Association will have a celebration, and there will actually, there might be some Japanese veterans there from the attack. So there's been this reconciliation which has aided in, in uh, kind of healing the wounds and healing the memory of Pearl Harbor between American veterans and Japanese veterans. Quite remarkable. Uh, a couple of years ago, we went down, Think, think Tech went down with oh. cameras to oh, Pearl yeah. Harbor. Yeah. And they had, I think it was the 70th anniversary yes. of the end of the war. Yeah. Um, that would have been in uh, 2015. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we, um, gee, it was so interesting that the, the, there was a Japanese mayor there from a city, a sort right. of sister city. Right. Um, and they came and they talked about uh, reconciliation yeah, yeah. and uh, swore eternal 
you know, loyalty and faithfulness and aloha to each other. That's correct. It was yeah. very touching. Yeah. And it, yeah. it, it, to me, I hadn't realized that it had gone that far, but yeah. it has. No, it, it absolutely. Now, in 1991, when this was proposed by a former fighter pilot from the Japanese squadron that bombed Pearl Harbor, a, a guy uh, who actually became a Christian, uh, became a Christian pastor, moved to Seattle and was in Seattle. He proposed this, this kind of reunion with uh, U.S. and uh, Japanese uh, soldiers or, or veterans. Uh, the president at that time, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, was outraged. Uh, he refused to allow it to happen, and he traveled to Pearl Harbor and gave, a, I think, two or three speeches. Uh, he didn't demonize the Japanese in 1991. He did not, but he talked about the valor of the American troops uh, in the Pearl Harbor attack. So, so there was still that kind of, uh, kind of Japanese as a superpower kind of tension between the United States and Japan. And, and, but eventually, this, these reunions were allowed to happen by the mid-1990s. Yeah. Uh, and, and while that was happening, we were having you know, issues, they call it issues, uh, with other countries right. uh, in Asia. And right. it, it just seemed, I think it seemed to the American public that Japan was our best friend in yeah. Asia. Yeah, and that has to feed into it. Yeah, I, I, yes, uh, definitely. Today uh, we see Japan as a staunch ally, and uh, uh, the 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 thing is, though, uh, Americans still celebrate Pearl Harbor as if it happened yesterday. Yeah. So, and there there are some parts of the country where uh, there's still some anti-Japanese feeling in, in the United That's States. True. So it's definitely uh, the the relationship is very a very strong alliance. Uh, but uh, Pearl Harbor still lives. Well, it, it stands for it stands for something in the American mentality, certainly in a historical context. And I guess the question I would put to you, John, is: yeah. you know, they say that George Santayana, you know, we should study it so we can <laughs> learn by it. Right, right. Uh, what what can we learn, we yeah. as a nation and the world for that matter? Right. What can we learn from Pearl Harbor? Right. Well, uh, I think we can we can learn about uh, World War II. Um, the 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 fact that we commemorate Pearl Harbor as we do, I think, tells us that we yearn for some si sort of a collective identity. Honestly, I think that's probably deep at a deeper kind of collective psychological level than anything else. Is Pearl Harbor brought us together? And before Pearl Harbor, uh, the Alamo brought us together, and Custer's defeat brought us together in myth mythical ways. I mean, the, you know, the histories that come out of this are many times not factually accurate, but uh, the, the yearning for a, a stronger collective identity is something which, which Pearl Harbor represents for, for Amer the American people. And I think it's, it's a kind of patriotism, it's a kind of nationalism that, nationalism. that, that Americans yearn for. And they say we're returning to that now. Not only the U.S., but uh, other places in the world are returning to a nationalism, and yeah. uh, it plays into that. But uh, we're deeply divided. I think, that, that's the, I think that's part of where the yearning comes from, is we're so divided as a nation right now that it's hard to imagine us being, you know, uh, all patriotic in the same way. Yeah. So Pearl Harbor is something that can kind of bridge completely that. Completely together. Yeah. 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 So can Pearl Harbor, you know, with the, you know, with, with the modern communications technology, with social media, with the way we've seen Donald Trump change politics, right. Um, right. you know, change the country right. using Twitter, right. imagine that. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the way uh, Putin uh, made his advance into Ukraine. It was a pretty tricky business. Right. There was no sneak attack there. Right. He managed the news. And so at the end of the day, he said, well, maybe he has a reason to go in there. Mm. We're not sure. Mm. It's not clear. Mm -hmm. We can't galvanize you know, NATO about this. We right. can't galvanize the world about right. it. Right. And he knew that. He played yeah. that. Yeah. So my question to you is, can there ever be another, you know, with those considerations, can mm. there ever be another sneak attack which galvanizes a nation virtually overnight? Can it happen? Oh, yeah, I think so, yes. Um, I, I think if we had another major terrorist attack like 9-11, I mean, you look at, uh, you know, after 9-11, by uh, 2003, when we have invaded Iraq, George W. Bush's approval ratings were in the high 80s. Uh, you know, 10% of Americans were opposed. So uh, that worked. Yeah, to kind of uh, galvanize the public towards a very kind of patriotic feeling, but it didn't last very long. 
I think the one thing about, uh, the one way to think about this is that it could happen in the future and it could galvanize the American public in the future, but the days of the kind of the peak of American nationalism is, nationalism is long past. So if it does galvanize the American public, it, it will be a short-term thing, relatively speaking. I think the, the, the impact of globalization and, and, uh, uh, and so, you know, people's identities are much more diffuse now than they were uh, in World War II. I, I, I don't think that, uh, at least in the foreseeable future, American nationalism is, is at the same strength that it was in World War II. Yeah. And, and it, I don't think we can be brought back the, the to that The greatest generation and all that. that. That's, yeah, so that's was, right. That was really a terrific time yeah. in many yeah. ways. Yeah. So uh, the other thing is, um, I, I keep thinking of Waterloo. Yeah. Waterloo was a historic event of great yeah. magnitude. It was a great, okay. great loss for Napoleon and all that. Mm -hmm. He met his Waterloo with part right. of the language right. around Europe and around the U.S. Right. And I, what it reflects to me is the passage of time kind of smooths all this out. So we have, we have today, we have a six-part series here, uh, <laughs> in, in, in a section in, uh, in the Honolulu Star Advertiser. Yeah. Um, and I would venture to say that although you and I have a certain recollection right. uh, of the intensity of this event, right. um, I think you know people coming up now, going through school now, studying right. history, right. as they may or may not do, right. are right. going to have much less sensitivity to it. And after a time, it becomes nomenclature and no more than that. Yeah. I, I, well, I don't see that happening with Pearl Harbor. One of the things is that uh, they do a great job at the Pearl Har at the USS Arizona Memorial of bringing people through and educating them. And the, one, of, one of the things that's very interesting about uh, the Pearl Harbor Memorial there is the film that you have to see before you go out. Interesting. Yeah, so that film, originally the, the film that was shown was a film from the early 1980s, which portrayed the Japanese invasion as quite successful and the Japanese is honorable, and of course people didn't like that, so that was pulled. The, the current film, uh, which has been in place since 1991, um, is a film in which the narrator, Chalker, uh, Stock, Stocker Channing, pardon me, uh, she talks about the sacrifice, and she doesn't say American sacrifice. She says, mourn the dead, respect their valor, and she doesn't say Americans or Japanese. It's universal. So, so the, the, the Park Service themselves have been able to universalize the experience of Pearl Harbor in a way that makes it okay for Japanese teenagers to come and visit, uh, you know, American, uh, uh, older Americans, uh, other, uh, you know, people from all over the world to come and visit the memorial and get something out of that film and that memorial. So. Uh, it, it's, it's really a, a fascinating thing to think about, that, that Pearl Harbor has actually been globalized. Yes. And, yes. Un, and universalized. Yes, and, and it stands and iconic, and it's, it's, yeah. a thousand yeah. feet yeah. tall, yeah. and it is right square in the middle of our state and our island. That's right. And it has defined Hawaii in so many ways it, we indeed. may forget, but indeed. it's all around. It's I mean, not only punch bowl. And collectively, those things are like the cemeteries in northern France. They stand a thousand feet tall and they are. You. The other interesting thing, if we have time, the other interesting thing is that Pearl Harbor was not a memorial immediately after the war. It took 15 years, 17 years actually, for Pearl Har Harbor to become a nationally recognized memorial. And the Pearl Harbor Association had a terrible time raising money for it. There was not that much interest in commemoration of Pearl Harbor in the early days after the war. So it was open in 1962, uh, but they had the, the Pearl, Harbor, Pearl Harbor Association, the, the Congress refused to give the money to finish the fundraising. They actually had to wait a couple of years to open it to raise the rest of the funds privately. So uh, it's interesting how this Pearl Harbor kind of industry has grown. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think in some ways it is an industry. We have to be a little bit skeptical that, you know, it's, uh, we, we get these kind of, you know, oh, uh, pitter-patter feelings in our heart when we think of Pearl Harbor, but it is, it's a tremendous industry out there. It's a tremendous industry for Hawaii. Yeah, not only for the American side, but the Japanese side. It has that's, significance that's correct. for them. That's correct. John David and Professor of History at HPU, Pearl Harbor Remembered. Thank you so much, John. You're welcome, Jay. Aloha.